today's video. It's all about using this laptop power supply to charge this battery. So what I'm going to do, I'll show you how it works, but also I'll show you my improved version. But first things first, we need to know a little bit more about this power supply. This is the laptop power supply, and we've got a close-up. We're looking for the output. It says 19.5 volts. You need well above 12 volts to charge up a 12 volt battery. 6.15 amps. And here, this is another important point. You've got the plug. You need to know which is positive, is centre positive and negative on the outside shell. And if you use the original socket that goes into the laptop, which I haven't got, you can cut that off, but you still need to know which wire is which, because if you don't, it won't work. OK, so I've switched on the power supply. I just need to know if it works or not. We'll just put the connectors in there. And what have we got? 19.93 volts. So it's working. OK, this is how it's done in the YouTube videos. We've got a power supply connected into 240 volts, the laptop power supply. And it comes over to here. And what happens? They use globes in, connected in series and they act as resistors so instead of putting 19 plus volts into the battery you put in about 13 or 14. So you've got switches here to switch them on and off to show you what's going on and then we've got an amp meter and a voltmeter and there's the battery I'm about to charge up. So to recap we've got the multimeter it shows your battery voltage and that shows you the amps going into the battery so this one here, this is a switch for this light globe. Watch what happens with the amp meter. And you'll see the battery volts, voltage is rising. So I've got about one and a half amps. So I'll switch that one off. And then we'll switch the big globe on, the headlight globe. Ooh, look at that. She really jumps up. Now it's about well over two amps. Now we can switch both of them on and you've got about two and a half amps going into the battery. What I don't like with this idea, if you want to change the globes all the time, it's a bit of a pain. So what I'm going to use is a transistor. So it works as a rheostat and you can infinitely change the voltage so it goes from a very small amount to a very large amount. So we'll just switch some of these off. Go to here. there it's off again and that's how they work on the YouTube videos but I'll show you how to do a different method and that it works a lot better one last thing in this section of the video all power supplies including this laptop power supply when you switch them off like I'm going to do now it is switched off but watch the amp meter when I switch on one of the lights see how it flicked up and then flicked off it remains charged this is going to be important for the next part of the video when I dismantle a microwave oven to get the big power transistor we need to make this circuit to work. Here is some more important information. This is the back of the microwave oven. You'll see the model number. Here it is there, the serial number and other details. This is a specific model that I'll be using but they have to be an inverter microwave oven. This is the badge you need to look for. It specifically says inverter system inside. So this is the type of microwave you need to get a big power transistor out of. Now we need to know if the microwave oven works. We'll switch it on. Yep, display's there. So we'll dial up 20 seconds. That's all we need. And push it on. Yep. There's no fault codes come up on the display, so the inverter part of the microwave is working well. This is what we need. This is the inverter power supply. We need to pull that out so we can extract the transistor from the heatsink. But first things first, remember what I was saying about the capacitor in that laptop power supply? Well, I've just run this. So this part here is the high voltage part. Now, if you want to short these out, this is how you do it. You put an insulated handle on the screwdriver and go across like that. 
Now, there was no spark whatsoever. And when I get the power supply out, I'll show you exactly why that happens. It's a safety feature on all microwave ovens. This is the safety feature I was talking about. Why there was no arc across those two terminals. This is a bleed resistor. What happens when you switch the microwave off, it actually drains those capacitors of the charge so it's safe to handle. On the older microwave ovens, that bleed resistor is actually inside the really large capacitors, but here it's out in the open. This is what the power supply looks like when it's out of the microwave oven. That is the power transistor there we want. That's another smaller power transistor. It still can be used, but it's not as great a capacity as that one. And there is the bridge rectifier. And what I'll do, I'll unsolder it and show you what they look like. I've gotten the heat sink out and this is the transistor you need this is what we're going to use but I'll give you a tip when you unsolder all these parts all these semiconductors here leave them attached to the heat sink and then unsolder them because what happens is if you're not good at soldering like I am it can make them very hot and ruin them this is the pay attention part of the video. So what we've got the transistor here, this part here is the gate. That's what switches the transistor on. These two wires here, that's the emitter and that's the collector. And they do actually go off to what you're switching on and off. But the unique part about it is that there is connected to the heatsink by the back of the transistor so you won't see me connect anything to that I'll just rather connect it to the heat sink this is the first wire we're going to put on that's the emitter there that goes to the negative terminal of the battery this is the second part you'll see one end of that globe is connected to the heat sink and the other wire goes to the positive terminal now this is a prototype of what we're actually going to do and the magic happens here. Now watch when I just gently touch the gate and I touch the positive terminal, it goes on and then if I just gently touch it you can see it get dimmer and dimmer and that's what we want to do. We go across to there, it goes brighter and there it goes dimmer. What you are seeing here when I go like that transistor's gate is very very sensitive the electricity is traveling through my body and then when I go like that we'll switch it off switch it on off on off so what we do to do now is to make some electronic controls to replace my fingers and to get it working properly I've added three electronic components to replace my fingers the potentiometer and that potentiometer is 10k or 10,000 ohms and two resistors, here's one that's about 1100 ohms or 1.1k ohms and that's exactly the same as that one there now we'll trace the wiring this is the negative side and that's the positive side so with the negative it comes over here through here, around here, through the resistor and then you go out back through there into the potentiometer and exactly the same thing happens here that was negative this is positive you go from here to here to the resistor and then from the resistor you go to the orange wire and that goes through to the potentiometer so you switch the transistor on the middle connection here in the potentiometer goes the yellow wire across to there and then to here and that's the gate and that's how it works and all I do is adjust that and you'll get a different voltage on your load this is the smoke and flames test I'm going to put a decent load on the power supply here so what we've got this one here that's your voltmeter that's my multimeter and that's the amp meter and what I'll be doing we've got it over there there's a headlight globe and what I'll be doing be putting a bit of cardboard over when it gets to about three or four volts as the glare tends to obstruct the view of my meters
as you can see it's starting to rise it's only a very tiny amount of voltage there so we've got it up to about 100 millivolts a tenth of a volt so I bring it up further so we've got 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 1 1.8 volts and the globe it's got barely a bit of brightness to it over there so I'll bring it up a bit more 6 volts, 7 volts starting to get a bit bright so I'll put the piece of cardboard on there and what have we got? we've got 7.7 .7 volts and we've got about three and three quarter amps so we'll see what this thing can do so as we're going up in voltage the amps are going up so we got the 14 so the car headlight they generally run about 14 and a half volts so it's just under five amps so there it works so the next thing I have to do now is put the battery on there and we'll see how well it works with the battery the battery has been connected for the big test and we'll see how well it works now we can see the battery voltage is really low and someone's going to ask why is that so this battery I picked up in hard rubbish and what's happened with it it's got one dead cell completely dead all the other five cells are perfectly okay so it's still good enough to use as a test for a battery charger so what will happen is I need to get above that voltage and when I get above that voltage you'll see the amp meter slowly rise up see as it goes up bring it back so we've got one amp we've got two amps three amps four amps five amps six amps Seven, ooh, better go back a bit. This uh, laptop power supply battery charger is only meant to go to six and a half amps. So if you overstress it, you'll ruin that charger. So I'll bring it back again. You can see it goes down. It's 13 volts. Bring it one amp. So you've got very fine control. As you can see the needle slowly moving up and down. I'm moving the potentiometer. It all works really well. So don't you think this is a better idea if you want to change the amps and volts on a battery charger by changing light globes? This idea gives you infinite control, electronic control. It works really well. Far better than changing out light globes. So far we've seen the controller use it as a light dimmer to control the brightness of the light globe and also we can control the rate for charging a battery but can we control the speed of an electric motor this is from a cordless vacuum cleaner and we'll see if we can get that to work I've had to put some weights on to that electric motor because if you try and start them up without restraining them they will take off like a rocket so here we go see the voltage and we'll see the amps now we'll drop now we'll raise it up there we go starting to come up now the motor is just starting to turn now we can see it at different speeds now we'll give it a fair bit Yeah, see what I mean? You've got to really restrain the motors, otherwise they'll jump around all over the place. But it works. You can change the speed of that motor. I know someone's going to say, why well, build one of these when I can go on eBay and buy one for $5? Well, if you don't want to learn anything about electronics, that's the way to go. But if you want to learn about electronics, build this circuit and get it running 
and you will learn a lot about electronics and that's the only way you'll learn by building something. So what we've got, we've got all these components. There's the IGBT, the transistor, that's an insulated gate bipolar transistor. There we've got the potentiometer, resistors, laptop power supply and the battery. So what I'm going to say is with these components, especially this one here, this one here, this one here and this one here and the power supply there. If you change them around because these ones here, I've given you values for these ones here, they're only a guide. If you get a potentiometer from another manufacturer it will change the parameters with this one here and same with the resistors and with the power supply if you change the voltage. So this is where a bit of a learning curve is in there and you'll have to learn how to change these resistors to make it work. I've built two other power supplies exactly the same as what you've seen previously with that laptop power supply and this is exactly in the same way. It's all made out of entirely second-hand materials, electronic components, the heat sink from a CPU in a, in a computer and the fan attached to keep it nice and cool. Now this one only goes up to 12 volts so you can run the fan as well as the transistor inside there. So it's quite easy to make and it's tidied up so it looks a bit more presentable and there's the output wires. Red is positive and black is negative. This is the first power supply. I'll show you the other one. This is the second power supply I've made. As you'll see it's got a computer fan on there and that's the heat sink off the CPU and the computer. So what we've got, that's the in, that's where the power supply goes in and there's your potentiometer you just move that around to adjust it and then you go across to here that there is the output and that can go to whatever you want whether it's a light globe, motor, battery or whatever so what we've got all these ones have got fans now the other one I showed you, the first one, the prototype using the laptop power supply that is very close to 20 volts so that's too high for a fan. So what I think is the ideal solution is get one of these. This is a switch mode power supply 240 volts and it's regulated at exactly 12 volts and there you can power the fan and have a separate power supply to operate a fan on that other power supply that I've made. The other way is you can use a voltage regulator but it adds a lot more complication to it. This one here is just plug in, connect up to the fan and away it goes. So also if you want some of these components there's a YouTuber called E-Waste Ben. Now he lives in Melbourne so if you ever want these components he sells them really cheap to you as he's always dismantled electronics to resell. So the best, I'll put a link in the description so you can see him and contact him.